while some online bullion dealers continue to charge almost $2 over spot for one ounce silver rounds, SD Bullion is selling one ounce silver rounds at only 49 cents over spot on any quantity. Again, that's 999 fine silver for just 49 cents over spot for any quantity. If you haven't joined the over 40,000 precious metals investors by making the switch to SD Bullion, what are you waiting for? You could save hundreds or even thousands of dollars on your next order. SD Bullion, the lowest prices, period. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It is September 18th, 2017. Life returning to normal in storm-ravaged Florida. And who knows, maybe life will one day return to normal in these uh, once great United States. But for now, we have what we have. And here is John Rabino to talk about precious metals prices, commitment of trader report, at commitment of traders report, etc. By the way, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com with any feedback. And John, so commitment of traders is dead. Long live the commitment of traders, right? <laughs> hey, Kerry. Yeah, th this is an indicator that, um, that, that predicts you know, six month or so cycles in gold and silver uh, by looking at what the guys in the futures contract market are doing uh, and gold bugs especially. But anybody who's been watching this market is waiting for the day that this indicator fails because it gets swamped by physical demand. In other words, everybody wants physical gold and silver. They don't care what's happening in the futures markets and the price just goes through the roof. And no matter what the um, the speculators or the commercials or whoever are doing in the futures market, uh, that didn't happen this time around. The uh, commitment of traders report is working again. You know, we we got a a really nice run in gold and silver after um, a bullish signal. Um, earlier in this year from the commitment of traders report. And then it got extremely bearish. In the last few months, um, the uh, the speculators who are always wrong at turning points have gone incredibly long, extremely long, you know, uh, almost historically long. And the uh, commercials who tend to be right at turning points have gone extremely short, which usually indicates a, a pretty big crack coming in the price of gold and silver. That didn't happen and it didn't happen and it didn't happen. And then this last week it happened. <laughs> the yeah. Gold and silver both got whacked and they're down fairly dramatically as we're speaking this morning. Um, but based on the, um, the level of speculator longs and commercial shorts, we've got a ways to go because, you know, it takes a, a pretty decent drop to flush out that much um, speculator enthusiasm, for instance, you know, they, they have to lose their enthusiasm and then go positively negative where they start shorting the market before it bottoms. So the next month or two could be on balance negative for gold and silver, or it could be flat and that could spook the speculators because they like action. I don't know, you know, whatever, but it, it uh, probably isn't going to be a huge increase in gold and silver prices going forward uh, until these imbalances get worked off, which is no big deal for anybody. You know, if you've got um, a portfolio of good quality mining stocks, you don't care about this. It's just a chance to add more. And if you're stacking physical gold and silver, same thing. You know, this is uh, the thing you're buying going on sale and you should put the same amount of money into it this month as you put into it last month, which means you'll get more this month and you shouldn't really worry about the squiggles because the eventual prize of $5,000 gold and $100 silver is out there. You know, it's coming based on the imbalances overall in the financial markets, which are continuing to expand. You know, we, we're still adding more debt in relation yeah. to GDP in every major system in the world. And we're seeing the central banks now um, start to try to 
moderate and to work off the bond portfolios that they've got and raise interest rates a little bit, which will totally spook the markets and um, especially crack equity prices, which are at record levels now almost across the board. You know, if interest rates are going up, you it's kind of hard to have equity prices going up at the same time, especially when they start at already historically overvalued levels. So a, a fairly reasonable scenario for the year ahead is that central banks tighten a little bit, which spooks the equity markets which spooks the Main Street economy, which spooks central banks and causes them to start easing again. And at that point, you get precious metals just taking off. So that's probably in some form something that we can look forward to in the year ahead or the couple of years ahead. And it'll make the stacking that we've done now and the uh, the accumulation of, for instance, junior mining stocks that we've been doing lately, we'll, it'll make those things seem very smart. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. Uh, I don't see anything happening over the horizon that is going to really improve uh the economic conditions, global economic conditions. I mean, what, A, even if they could do something, they wouldn't do it, like uh, like get the government out of uh, all of our business and get it out of the market and let the market uh, find its way. But yet, uh, th- then we've got these uh, hurricanes that happen. Now, fortunately, the one in, in Florida here, not that expensive, 20 to 40 billion in damage they're talking about. As long as you didn't live in Key West or in Naples, you were okay. But uh, still, Houston, it's got a long ways to go. All of these things, are they really going to help the economy having to come up with the uh, $200 billion to fix Houston and Florida? And uh, don't forget the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and and uh, and the Keys, right? Oh, yeah, this is great for the economy, Carrie, because the government has to spend more money to fix all this stuff. Um, and any amount of government spending is a good thing. So this this is going to be very positive for the economy going forward. It'll give us more growth and put more people to work. So it's on balance a good thing. It's a shame we can't have more hurricanes and more earthquakes. <laughs> yeah, um, that's all we need. Then, yeah, the, you know, the Keynesian economists would, would consider that a huge positive change in the global economic environment. Um, so you would think they would be in favor of Climate change, yeah. when you put it that way, right? Because it right. breaks more windows. <laughs> right, and then we can induce... <laughs> the, the broken window theory of it, economics. You know, they're talking about this massive uh, super volcano brewing in Yellowstone. Uh, that could be the ultimate infrastructure program for the U.S., right? <laughs> oh, if, if the western half of the U.S. blew up, can you imagine the road building programs we could have then? Yeah. Ah. Of course, I don't like to get around about that because that's our natural disaster out here. I'm in Idaho right. and we're in the uh, extinction circle <laughs> if something like that goes off. <laughs> so let's put that off for a while if we can. Just uh, focus on manageable things like earthquakes and hurricanes and things. <laughs> Oh, man. What are we going to do here, John? I mean, uh, watching like it's watching the Indianapolis 500, where usually you want to see one crack up, because just to know that the cars are really going that fast. But now we're seeing like every car in the race just uh, crash and go up the wall and splinter into a thousand pieces. It's it's not a good thing to see. Yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, um, another analogy uh, using a a car race as a setup is that we're we're seeing a lot of cars go way too fast and drive in ways that clearly point towards some kind of a crack up coming. But but a lot of the crack ups haven't come yet. You know, the wrecks are still to come. And if you look at the finances of any major country, you see that we're taking on debt at an accelerating rate when we've already borrowed more than we should have to begin with. Mm -hmm. So look at Europe, where deficits are always big at the national level and unfunded liabilities for their their social programs are immense while you've got all the baby boomers retiring and and turning this um, balance sheet issue into a cash cash flow issue. You know, Europe is going bankrupt because of this. Japan is even worse because they're even older. You know, they've got more people retiring and their uh, their government is in even more deep debt 
relative to GDP than European governments are. And China, of course, took on more debt than any other country has ever taken on in the past decade. And they're still at it. You know, they're still adding a, a trillion, trillion five per year in new credit. <laughs> Uh, on top of an yeah. unmanageable amount that they've got. And the U.S., you know, the U.S. dollar, <laughs> which you would think I would say because I run a, a site called dollarcollapse.com, but uh, is in a really interesting situation right now because you're seeing a lot of countries take very active steps to um, limit their need for dollars. For instance, China just set up a uh, a gold futures ex or excuse me, an oil futures exchange that's going to be priced in yuan and yeah. backed by gold. So they say. Yeah, and if, if that's the case, then one of the world's biggest oil markets will not require dollars for the buying and selling of oil, and one of the reasons why the dollar is, is still the world's reserve currency, is that you basically have to have dollars to buy oil. And you need dollars to do a lot of other kinds of international trade, right? So you need to have dollars, whoever you are. Well, if that's not the case anymore, then all these people who have accumulated all these dollars out there will rebalance. They'll sell some of their dollars and accumulate whatever other currencies they're using for their, their major trading activity. And that's going to be an immense amount of selling pressure on the dollar if that if that turns out to be true. You know, if, um, if China and Russia and India um, and Iran and Venezuela and whoever else is, is threatening to dispense with dollars, if they actually succeed, then that's trillions of dollars overseas hitting the, the market and a lot of it flowing back to the U.S. So that's going to be a, a huge distortion for the U.S. financial system. And it's going to lead to us having to live within our means because we can't just create as many dollars as we want to and send them out into the world in return for free stuff anymore. Um, if that happens. Well, that's a drag. There, <laughs> yeah, there is no way we can live within our means based on the way the system is set up right now. You know, even if you just look at officially reported debt, you know, we need another trillion dollars a year um, in order to pay our bills mm -hmm. at their current level. And that doesn't include unfunded liabilities where we're racking up debts that we're not reporting as debt. You know, that's another several oh, trillion yeah. dollars a year. So you, if, if we actually had to come up with the money for that, mm -hmm. it would be, um, you know, financial and political nightmare. The amount of taxes that would have to be raised to cover that mm -hmm. uh, would basically double the the tax take of the government, or and then some, you know, and and who's going to pay those extra taxes, um, it, rather than voting against the people trying to raise their taxes? So you get, first of all, political, or first of all, financial and economic turmoil, followed by political turmoil, and uh, a descent into chaos, if the dollar loses a big part of its reserve currency status. So we will see if. If it, if it plays out that way. But China and Russia are financially pretty powerful. And they've been buying gold on a vast scale for years now. And we're starting to see why they bought that gold. So they can back um, various parts of their economies with something that people see as a safer bet than dollars. Mm -hmm. So the, um, you know, the futures contract, which will pay you off in gold if anything goes wrong, is a pretty safe bet compared to something like at, at the COMEX, for instance, where uh, people say, oh, the, the COMEX metal exchange can never default because they can always pay off their gold and silver contracts in cash. Yeah. Or in <laughs> well, uh, shares of uh, GLD and SLV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and exactly. that, those are financial assets that aren't backed by anything. Whereas in China, if um, if something happens on their oil exchange and they're going to give you gold, um, you didn't really lose anything and you may have gained something in the process. So that's a safer bet. That's a better deal. And it's yeah. reasonable to expect global traders to look at that and at least consider it. Oh, for sure. So, so if this works, it's liable to spread. 
because there's a lot of gold in the East now. They've been buying it for years. They've been soaking up basically all the output of the world's gold mines for the past several years. And um, they have accumulated plenty of gold to do things like this if they want to. Well, uh, they've tried to do other stuff. Not a, not a lot has worked on those exchanges. Not to say this one won't. It certainly may possibly. But well, uh, Carrie, the, the we Shanghai Gold say. Exchange is very high volume in China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a physical exchange, which presumably, if it continues to grow, will we'll gain pricing power in the market. So well, that's one thing that has worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is true. Well, hey, uh, so so what are we uh, what are we going to do here is the question. <laughs> well, in, in the U.S., there's only so much you can do because it's the local currency that's at risk. But it, I mean, it's the same thing everywhere. If you've got a bank account in yen, you know, you live in Japan and mm -hmm. you own a lot of yen, you're at risk. Same yeah. thing in Europe if you own a lot of euros. And if we here have big bank accounts and government bond balances and things like that, when the next um, ex economic and financial and monetary experiment uh, experimental cycle starts and that affects the value of these big currencies, then we're in trouble. You know, if you own a big dollar bank account and a um, government bond fund and the value of the dollar goes down, then you lose a lot of money. So what we can do is shift our finances away from financial assets and towards real assets. Yes. With gold and silver going down lately, that's a, not a bad time to start a stacking program or to buy some mining stocks or something like that. You know, those are the things that tend to, oh, actually, um, you had a a listener send in a question, Kerry. Oh, Remember, it yes. was about uh, we, we, which this is a good spot to cover it. I think right. I think where right. yeah, you know what what happens to the stock market if the dollar falls in value? Aren't stocks financial assets, and don't they go down? And the answer to that is um, stocks are basically ownership shares in companies, and different companies own different things. So if a company owns real assets, for instance, a gold mining company owns gold in the ground, then they tend to do okay because they represent, their shares represent real assets. But bank stocks represent financial assets and they will tend to be hurt in a currency crisis. So it's not like all equities are one thing or the other, good or bad in a financial crisis. Um, the, the ones that represent ownership in assets that go up in value during that crisis are actually good things to own and vice versa. So in the same way that you're shifting your bank account and your government bond funds into real assets, it might make sense to shift your equity portfolio towards real assets. In other words, dump the bank stocks uh, and insurance companies and brokerage stocks, things like that, and focus on energy and raw materials of various kinds and real estate, really well-chosen real estate, not highly leveraged real estate. So you can buy equities that represent those things and they will tend to do better than your bank stocks would have otherwise. Yeah. And uh, he asked that question in the perspective of uh, what happened in Germany uh, when the uh, mark, uh, you know, when they had their currency collapse after World War I, before World War II. And what happened was, uh, I think they came with the uh, rents mark after, after the uh, uh, Weimar Republic collapsed. And in the stocks, uh, they basically, for every mark uh, your stock was worth, you know, they made a one-to-one -one ratio for the new currency to whatever the price of stocks uh, trading. So effectively, uh, I don't know how it worked out exactly, but uh, uh, if you had losses, they weren't as catastrophic as uh, as if you were holding the currency. Yeah. Well, um, th there's no guarantee something like that happens this time around. You know, that was a political decision when one currency was being replaced with another. Uh, we, we've seen some examples more recently of um, a really aggressive inflation taking hold in a country and the stock market going up. Right. That happened in Venezuela and it happened in Zimbabwe. Uh, whether the stock market itself went up enough to offset the fall in value of the currency, I don't know. But the, the chart of the stock market is almost parabolic. It's really straight up. Uh, and that's because when the currency goes down and a company doesn't change, you know, the, the value of that company will go up in the local currency because you're basically just changing the measuring stick, you know. Um, and so the stock market in general has gone up in those countries. However, within the stock market, there were winners and losers, relatively speaking. And I, I think 
in a financial crisis, you know, when the currency is becoming less and less valuable, you don't want to be involved with something like a bank, which has loans out, <laughs> you know, they're getting paid in that currency. So they're losing money over time or losing wealth over time as that currency goes down in value and the value of their loan payments coming in goes down. So I, I think the general thesis that shifting from financial assets to real assets is a good thing applies to the stock market as well. You know, you can still own stocks, but uh, it's probably better to own stocks of companies that have real assets rather than companies that have fictitious assets like bank loans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think it uh, makes a lot of sense there. And, you know, who knows what they're going to do to try to recover or reset or rescue the system. But uh, relying upon the uh, good sense or the largesse of government has always, in my experience, been a major mistake and potentially a catastrophic mistake that uh, just assume the government will always do the wrong thing. And then if they do the right thing, you're going to be in for a pleasant surprise. But, uh, but if history is uh, if past is prologue, then forget about uh, the government figuring out something that's going to help you get through this storm. You got to do it on your own. But assuming, of course, the storm comes, which the odds seem to increase every day, John. So, hey, questions, comments, uh, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. The Twitter feed's at Kerry Lutz. The Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Check out John's site, dollarcollapse.com. Sign up for his newsletter. Sign up for ours at financialsurvivalnetwork.com. And we will resume again in a week, John. Good. Bye, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.